This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of December 4th, 2022. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 267. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this edition... Headlines from the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Northwest. The Is It Just Me commentary. I word a virtual Nanaimo bar to a difference maker. And the big deal feature. Hundreds, if not thousands of commuters were stuck overnight in gridlock last week when winter arrived. Why did so many municipalities and the BC Ministry of Transportation fail to prepare roads and bridges for the storm? New Westminster City Councilor Daniel Fontaine remembers City of Vancouver's Snowmageddon 2008 and comments on the region-wide Snowmageddon 2022. But first, is it just me? Is it just me, or is this the sound of hope and courage? No one is free until we're all free. Um, that means that women are free, men are free, Chinese are free, People from Xinjiang are free, right? Some of the whole, men are not free, we are 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 free, we I recorded that clip on November 27th outside the Vancouver Art Gallery. It was a candlelight vigil for the Uyghur Muslims who died in an apartment fire in Urumqi, the capital of China's Xinjiang province. The people who died in Urumqi were victims of the Chinese Communist Party's strict zero-COVID lockdowns. Some 200 people gathered on a rainy Vancouver night, many of them foreign students from mainland China. They sang, they chanted lit candles, and placed flowers on the art gallery steps in a show of solidarity for people across the Pacific. That's the sound of hope because the November 24th tragedy ignited protests around China, where young people gathered to call for freedom and the end of Xi Jinping's leadership. That's also the sound of courage because China's government is notorious for taking extreme measures to snuff out dissent inside and outside China. In a world where we're told that democracy is in decline, It's good to know that there are people who will take that chance to beg to be heard and beg to be respected by their leaders. What do you think? Email bob at thebreaker.news. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. Snowmageddon 2 in the Lower Mainland. A late afternoon snowstorm on November 29th crippled highways and bridges across numerous municipalities. Hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, were stranded for more than eight hours on some routes, stuck in their cars in freezing conditions overnight. ICBC reported a nearly 100% spike in accident claims. My guest this week is Daniel Fontaine, a recently elected city councillor in New Westminster on the New West Progressive slate. The 2022 Snowmageddon came almost 14 years after the one in 2008, when Daniel was publishing the City Caucus blog with Mike Klassen. Back then, Gregor Robertson was Vancouver's new mayor, and he was holidaying in Mexico when a snowstorm ground Vancouver to a halt. Where were you when the storm was happening, the snow was flying, and uh, cars were being stopped all over? Where were you when the storm happened, and what were you hearing as it was happening? Well, I was very fortunate, Bob, that I was in, uh, I live in uh, Keyside, which is effectively the downtown core for New Westminster. So I have pretty much everything at my doorstep. So I can either walk or take a very, very short commute and and get to it. So I had, I believe, a series of meetings in the afternoon. And then I had um, another one scheduled for around five o'clock. And then when I left my meeting downtown, I think it was close to seven o'clock. I had, my car was covered in snow. It was it was um, at least a good two, three inches uh, covered, so I had to clear that off. So I, I knew at that stage that um, notwithstanding the fact that I had um, some uh, ability to, to move around, I, I figured things must be in really poor shape kind of around. So I made it home and then I immediately kind of turned on uh, through Twitter, Facebook, and just on the news and just radio started listening into what was happening and, and couldn't believe my ears. I just felt like it was kind of like deja vu again, like you said, going back to 2008. 
and and how um, ill prepared our region seemed to be for something as and I you know I've lived here a long time and and I've seen some pretty bad snowstorms. This was not a particularly bad snowstorm. It was actually um, uh, in terms of the overall amount of snow, I would say it wouldn't even rank in the top you know, 20% in terms of <laughs> snowfall events. But something happened, Bob, that that I'm curious about, and I hope other civic officials and the Minister of Transportation is also curious about is, how did it uh, turn into a complete, uh, utter traffic gridlock and chaos in Metro Vancouver? Um, who uh, should be held accountable for that? What things should we be doing or could we be doing? I I'm just curious. And I think that that's why I've called for the snow summit to gather the appropriate officials under one roof and to invite the media and the public to, to uh, listen in and to hear what happened. And perhaps there's a very plausible explanation, um, but perhaps not. And I, as a civic leader, as a newly elected civic leader and someone who has been intimately following these weather events for the better part of uh, probably close to a decade and a half, um, I'm in a position now that I have a voice to, to call for that and that's what I've done. I'm uh, sharpening my freedom of information pencil and also uh, appealing to anyone out there who was affected by this, anyone who was stuck overnight uh, far from home or far from work, freezing in their car, um, or anyone who was out there helping people uh, deliver coffee or whatever they needed. I'm appealing to anyone who's got any stories to come forward as well. And if there's any whistleblowers on the inside of uh, government operations, uh, uh, please contact me, Bob, at thebreaker.news. Now, you're proposing the snow summit. You want to bring municipal leaders, provincial highways officials together to find out what went wrong and how to prevent this, because this was something that went across municipal boundaries. I was looking at uh, maps showing how uh, routes that connected Richmond to New Westminster, to Coquitlam, to Delta, uh, and even a little bit further to Vancouver, as well as to uh, Burnaby and Surrey. This was something that went across boundaries. And that's something that we've got a problem here. Uh, you're now in municipal politics. We got a couple of dozen municipal halls uh, around. And of course, there's always been questions why we need so many, why there can't be some amalgamation. But we do have Metro Vancouver. We've got uh, various mechanisms that do bring politicians together. And I guess that might be something when the snow summit happens is to ask why aren't the existing institutions doing their job to uh, encourage that discourse and encourage the sharing of ideas and the cooperation that's needed well look uh when we have a snowstorm like this the snow does not know where the boundary is between new westminster and uh burnaby or new westminster and surrey at this it's a snow event in our region and and Yes, there are perhaps uh, areas closer to the water that might be less affected than those away from the water. But nonetheless, as you point out, the effects of the snowstorm that we had this week was re region-wide. So uh, if you look at the Google Maps, a lot of people have posted it online when it was at its worst. You look at, there was so many provincial highways and on-ramps and off-ramps and also um, uh, major arterials and major streets within uh, the urban settings. That were simply parking lots. I mean, I, I I was aghast at looking at some of the images and video that people were putting on these side streets and and uh, little little areas that nobody commutes in were just jam packed with cars. They couldn't they couldn't go anywhere. And as I've said earlier, you know, as you know, Bob, if you have one bridge down in this region, just one major bridge, it's traffic mayhem. <laughs> And that's in the summer without snow. So I'm talking on a clear day. So now add the snow in and bring down effectively four or five bridges so that there's no ability for people to cross them. You know, are we surprised that we were in traffic gridlock? I'm not. I, I mean, you just, that's going to happen. But I guess the summit itself is really, like you said, to bring that regional perspective to this. So it's not a bunch of municipalities that are all looking at, did we put out the salt in time or did we have enough tow trucks, et cetera? This is a region wide. If if one city like New Westminster or Surrey or Vancouver doesn't um, pull their weight and doesn't do what they need to do, it can shut the entire regional grid down. And that's that's the the point I think you're making is we need to talk about this at the regional level. So that's why I'm calling for 
uh, Mayor uh, George Harvey, the chair of the Metro Vancouver Board, newly elected chair, as well as Minister Rob Fleming um, from uh, the island. I mean, I believe Mr. F Minister Fleming is from a the, the relative tropical climate uh, of southern Vancouver Island, which I don't think was impacted as as much, and in fact, perhaps not even at all. So I'd love it if Mr. Minister Fleming would come over here to Vancouver, sit down in a room with uh, Mayor Harvey, and bring some fire chiefs. BC Ambulance, TransLink, Mainland Contracting. I mean, I could go on and on the list of people who should be in that room. And uh, they should be bringing them in and at a table and a microphone. And we should hear from them as to what happened and, and what went well and, and what didn't go well. And I think that, Bob, this is pretty basic stuff. I, this is not rocket science to call people together when you have a major event like this and do a post kind of a mortem on, on what went wrong and what went right. And I think that that's why it's so resonated with so many people in the public when Councillor Annis and I called for this, because they're just going, this is a no brainer. Uh, we should have been doing this a long time ago. Yeah, back in 2008, uh, when it happened, it made international news because Vancouver was uh, the next host city of a Winter Olympics just over a year away in uh, 2010. So there was a lot of action that was taken uh, from the airport to the transit system to the uh, highways, a whole bunch of uh, snow equipment was purchased, more salt, sand, everything else, and people retrained. Uh, this time around, it seems like the lessons, uh, pre-Olympic lessons, were forgotten, or the people that were in charge back then have retired or moved on to other things these days. Um, of course, we're also seeing uh, a bit of a collapse in, in the provision of basic services by governments at all levels, local, provincial, federal, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, federal passport offices, whether it's provincial driving offices, a lot of things have been affected by the pandemic, which has uh, uh, affected all our lives and uh, caused a work from home culture, which uh, governments are still struggling to uh, to adapt to. But what are some other uh, comparisons. Uh, what what did you see through this snowmageddon, the 2022 version, that ring familiar with 2008, and what is different this time? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that there there are, there are definitely some similarities and definitely some differences between what happened in 2008 and and I had a front row seat, as you said. I, I was interviewed quite a bit by the media at that point with the City Caucus uh, blog. But there were definitely some similarities and definitely some differences. And on the similarity side, uh, clearly the um, the impact to traffic and the impact to um, uh, you know being able to move around, accessibility, etc. There was definitely some some similarities on that. But here, I actually think there was more differences to this storm than there were similarities. And here are, is my observation in terms of the differences. This was a very quick storm. It came in and it went out very fast. So we did get some snow and it had impact, but then it, it left. And, and yes, we still have some snow on the ground, obviously, and it's still cold temperatures. But in 2008, if you recall, it just never ended. It just this one storm after another storm after another storm. Now, I hope, Bob, for our sake in this region that we're not back on that 2008 track again. Because if you remember, it started a bit it kind of early and it just didn't go away. It just kept coming in the storm. We kept thinking the rain was coming and the rain never did arrive. It just kept snowing. And so what happened was in 2008 that the ice people didn't clear the sidewalks, the ice built up on sidewalks and main roads, and then effectively snow removal equipment and, and snow removal equipment on roads and sidewalks was effectively not working. And, and last time we didn't have enough salt. I remember if, if you recall people, the, the cities were dumping salt and it was like the Hunger Games. People were like, you know, taking their buckets and trying to get salt and trying to find basic... I mean, I, I don't see that happening. Uh, it did that. That wasn't the case this time. That's what surprises me the most about this storm, Bob. Is um, you know there is a bit of a kind of a, a narrative here that the first storm is always the worst. So the first is the worst in the Lower Mainland, and it takes a while for people to get used to it. But I've never seen so many bridges and so many provincial on ramps and off ramps impacted by this by this move. Now, I've been hearing that you know, a lot of finger pointing and people blaming the province or the province blaming the municipalities. Or In fact, I heard, you know, they were blaming the commuters who were trying to get home to actually, um, you know, d leave early from work. So it's been a lot of finger pointing, a lot of blame. And, and I'm trying to change this discussion a bit from all of that to let's actually find out what happened as opposed to what we think happened. 
And um, we know that this storm um, had some similarities to 08, but it was unique in some ways too, in terms of its impact on the regional, um, the grid. So uh, we'll see, but I'm, I'm hopeful if we get those folks gathered together that we'll get some frank answers from them. Talk about getting back to basics. Our governments uh, at all levels have big ideas, uh, sending people to big international events. They want to save the world in so many ways, but they're losing sight of providing us the basics. Yeah, Bob, you, you raise a really good point. You know, municipal governments have over the last number of years, in fact, probably a better part of over a decade, have really um, undertaken what I refer to as scope creep. They're taking on a lot of, of activities and paying for them and focusing on uh, a lot of activities that would not be considered as part of core services. You know, as an elected official in, in New Westminster, I consider core services uh, making sure that the sidewalks aren't broken, making sure that the roads are operable, making sure that, you know, the lights are on. These are core things that the public expects from their municipal governments. They, and they expect, like you said, from the federal government that when they apply for a passport, they're gonna get a passport. If we uh, lose the public's confidence on those basic core services, I'm worried that we're going to lose their confidence on a lot of other things. And so it's so critical that when something like a snowstorm happens, that we make sure we have good plans, we have good salt trucks, we have good snow plows, we have good emergency management systems so that, um, you know, perhaps text messages can go out to people's cell phones telling them that, you know, the radar is indicating in the next hour snow's coming and et cetera. These are all basic things. And I think that um, while I'm, I'm not saying cities shouldn't talk about things that aren't necessarily part of the core, all I'm saying is um, it's incumbent upon all of us who are civic officials um, to make sure that we do take care of those core services and, it, and that we do them well. And that if, if we can exceed on those areas, I think the public will provide some latitude for, for elected officials to perhaps go a little bit beyond their their local mandate and do other stuff but at this stage bob i i'm seeing and i am concerned that we are perhaps as cities and municipalities not focusing enough on that on that basic uh level of service and i don't know whether that had anything to do with what happened with the snowstorm this week in our reaction but i certainly will be asking uh that type of question if we can get that snow summit there i'd love to present as a delegation and and see if we could uh, get that uh response to that question that was Daniel Fontaine, New Westminster City Councillor. What do you think? Email bob at thebreaker.news. Now it's time on the Breaker.News podcast for Around the Rim. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Rim. In Kyoto News, Olympic scandals may cloud Sapporo 2030 bid, Tokyo Games official. The former chief of the Tokyo Olympics Organizing Committee expressed concern Thursday that a widening corruption scandal related to last year's major sporting event may negatively affect Sapporo's bid to host the 2030 Winter Games. Seiko Hashimoto, who also served as the country's Olympic minister, said it is important to get to the bottom of the allegations as soon as possible so Sapporo can proceed in its campaign to host the 2030 event. In Hong Kong Free Press... Timeline, key dates in China's blank placard zero COVID protests. Dissatisfaction with China's strict anti-epidemic measures has been brewing for several months with small protests, online and offline, emerging ahead of major events and after COVID-related tragedies. September 18th, quarantine bus crash in Guizhou. Late September, Shenzhen protest. October 13th, the Beijing Sitong Bridge protest. Late October onwards, Foxconn lockdown at the iPhone plant in Zhengzhou. Mid-November, Guangzhou protest. November 20th, maskless World Cup kicks off. Chinese watching TV by the millions. November 24th, a fire in Urumqi, an apartment fire that killed at least 10 people who were locked in. November 25th, the Urumqi protest. November 26th, University Action and Shanghai protest on Urumqi Road. November 27th at noon, Tsinghua University Assembly. November 27th evening, rallies in multiple cities. Where will it all end? That's Around the Rim on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. Now it's time on the Breaker. 
Anchor.News podcast for Cascadia Calling. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Northwest. In the Oregonian, Merritt Paulson to sell Portland Thorns, maintain ownership of Portland Timbers. Paulson is now seeking a buyer for the women's professional soccer team, founded in 2013, that won its league-best third championship in November. The asking price? Upwards of $60 million. Paulson will include a $1 million donation to the NWSL to help establish a player safety department. U.S. Soccer's investigation found that Paulson and his executives enabled and vouched for Paul Riley, the former coach of the Thorns, accused of sexual misconduct by multiple former players. In King 5, a potential freight strike could cripple Washington's economy. Data from the Washington State Department of Transportation shows Washington transports about $680 billion worth of goods. One-third of goods are moved by rail. For example, nearly 40% of wheat grown in eastern Washington for export gets to ports by rail, according to Washington State Department of Commerce. Take away rail and that leaves trucks, but according to the Department of Commerce, it would take 180 trucks to carry the same amount of cargo as one train. In Czech news, Vancouver Island marmot at risk of being wiped out, wild species report. At least 2,253 species are at risk of being wiped out, according to the comprehensive new report on the status of wild plants, animals, insects, and fungi in Canada. Uh, Among those in greatest danger are North Atlantic and North Pacific right whales, the blue whale, the say whale, the common gray fox, and the Vancouver Island marmot, which were listed as critically imperiled. That's Cascadia calling on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. The virtual Nanaimo Bar, brought to you by Spruce Hill Contracting. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanaimo Bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to Amnesty International for its 22nd Right for Rights campaign on December 10th, International Human Rights Day. On that day, Amnesty International supporters will be writing letters to governments asking them to free political prisoners, such as Chow Hang Tung, a lawyer from Hong Kong serving 22 months in jail, is crime, asking people on social media to light candles to commemorate the Tiananmen crackdown, and Alexandra Skochelenko from Russia, who faces up to 10 years in prison for opposing Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Find out how you can support this campaign. Go to amnesty.ca. You can nominate someone for a virtual Dynamo bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. Spruce Hill Contracting, custom homes and renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. That's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of December 4th, 2022. I'm Bob Mackin. Thanks for joining me. Did you know that on the 4th of December in 1909, the Montreal Canadiens were founded and the first Grey Cup game was played? University of Toronto Varsity Blues beat the Toronto Parkdale Canoe Club 26 to 6. Now you know. Send me your feedback. Send me your story ideas to Bob at TheBreaker.News. Bookmark TheBreaker.News. You can also find us at TheBreaker.ca. Sign up for the email newsletter and get updates to your inbox. For news as it happens, follow The Breaker News on Twitter and visit TheBreaker.News on Facebook. You can support The Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to Patreon.com slash TheBreakerNews. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash TheBreakerNews. Until next week.